looks good. All right, we are live. We are rolling. Welcome to Hannah's Corner, Aubrey. So glad to have you on. Thank you so much for having me, Hannah. This is great to meet you. Great to meet you too, albeit virtually, but it's the best we've got right now. <laughs> we have, yep. <laughs> For those of you tuning in for the first time, welcome to Hannah's Corner. It's something you can tune into now as we're rolling or um, afterwards. And it's basically a way to stay engaged with women in jazz and a way to foster a sense of community with women in jazz, both on the industry side as performers or more behind the scenes. We've had on Lydia Lieb been a great publicist and she's my publicist, actually. <laughs> publicist, that's yeah. <laughs> yeah. And many other about, you know, networks and connections. It's growing. It's a growing community. Mm -hmm. So, um, Aubrey, really thrilled to have you on. For those of you who are not familiar with Aubrey Johnson, she is a New York-based vocalist, composer, and arranger. She just debuted her recent album, March of this year, called Unraveled. She features, specializes in Brazilian jazz music and creative contemporary music. I really like that. Um, both with and without words, she received her master's in jazz performance from NEC and was a member of the prestigious Gold Company at Western University. She has won several Downbeat Jazz Vocalist Awards and has toured extensively throughout the globe. So mm -hmm. welcome. Thanks so much for being here. And let's just dive in. Great. So as far as your background goes and just how you got into jazz, I was wondering if you could share a little bit about your story, your entree into the jazz world. Sure. Um, so I decided that I wanted to be a singer when I was really young, like probably around six years old. I was sure that's what I wanted to do. And, um, and I started playing classical piano like a year later. And um, I initially was really into pop and I wanted to be, I dreamed of being a pop star and I was really all about that. And then when I was, I think 12 or 13, my mom put me in jazz piano lessons with this amazing teacher in Green Bay, Wisconsin, where I'm from. Her name is uh, Christine Salerno, we're still very close. Um, we just actually this summer, I was in Wisconsin and got to work with her a little bit again. It was awesome. Um, but basically because of her guidance, uh, I got into jazz. St started out with just jazz piano and then she had me, you know, just started giving me standards to sing. And it was a really nice way to be introduced to it. It was really more from the piano side, from the instrumental side. And I just, you know, listened and sang along to what I heard and learned um, about the singing part of it more, I guess, organically. And, um, I think the reason my mom put me in jazz piano lessons uh, was because my uncle, who I know we're going to talk about more, um, is a jazz piano player, was a jazz piano, he just passed away in February. His name is Lyle Mays, and so he, of course, he's an amazing composer and was touring the world throughout my whole childhood, so I was really influenced by that, but um, it was sort of the combination of things that, that got me into jazz. And then I decided it's what I wanted to do when I think I was like 16 and I decided to go to college for it. So oh, I admire your tenacity. I know it can be a, it, it kind of a overwhelming. I mean, when I first was exposed to jazz, I'm like, there's so much I have to learn. And, and just to be at 16 and know that's what you want to do. That <laughs> that moment hit me a little bit later. I think I started out like young, just playing. And then it took a while to get to that point where it's like, OK, I'm ready to take on this this industry, this career, which is not for everybody. So I give you yeah. credit. Thank you. And you too, but it, it's really not. But I feel like because my uncle was very successful, my whole family just saw music as a career option. And I saw it as that, like from a young age, it was like, oh yeah, of course I'll just do this, you know? Even though I don't think I had any idea how hard it was, how it was going to be, but you know, that's okay. <laughs> I um I love your voice. I had a chance to listen to Unravel, your recent, your, your album from March and just, your voice is so pristine. I just, it's unlike any I've heard. It has like an effervescent kind of quality to it. And oh, it's so, such a beautiful tone, so tone driven that when you, you know, sing your, your melodic improvised lines, it's just, it feels so bright and light. And I get this sense of, of happiness just from listening. It's like very uplifting. And is there something heavy about oh, that's, that's wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> just wondering how you came into your how you discovered your your sound you know because a lot of times right as, as jazz instrumentalists and vocalists we emulate or, or come up through the tradition trying to maybe sound like an artist or heavily influenced but I feel like you really achieved your own place your own sound mm, thank you um I think it's really due to my voice type I'm like a very high soprano 
And so trying to sing low, like trying to emulate a jazz singer, like a traditional jazz singer, more like, you know, Cassara Vaughn or Ella or Billy or Carmen, um, it's a little harder for me because my voice just doesn't really produce like a good sound in those low ranges. So while I spent a lot of time imitating them, like to the best of my ability, it was sort of clear I could never really sound like them, like it wasn't even close. So, so it was sort of like, you know, not in a negative way, but just like, this is not my instrument. So I feel like I was forced to develop my own sound that worked for my range, you know? And that's, that's why I write my own music and arrange my own stuff because I can put it in a place where my voice fits. Whereas I think a lot of like material that's out there maybe doesn't naturally, you know, I don't, don't naturally fit. So it was kind of like a necessity but it also felt like, um, I would say, an organic process that happened just by taking everyone in that I possibly could, no matter if I could sound like them or not, and then just filtering it through me, and you know, that's what ended up coming out, I guess, but. <laughs> well, it's worth it. <laughs> yeah, glad you like it. <laughs> oh, it's gorgeous, and did, did you have a particular, um, you know, someone in, that you looked up to that had your range or that, that you kind of were inspired by? Um, I guess not really. That's been a tough thing, like just not really having anyone that I can feel like I sound similar to. I guess um, Margarita, Margarita Bengston of The Real Group has like issues of jazz soprano. Um, and she's one that I, you know, have listened to a little bit and, you know, appreciate what she does. And then um, the singer that sings the, the Duke Ellington Sacred Concerts, which now I can't think of her name, but it's, I know it. Um, Alice Babs, I think. I think that's it. Yeah. Um, she's a jazz soprano as well. So, but I wouldn't say I spent a ton of time listening to them because they don't have a lot of stuff out there, but, you know, it was at least I found like kindred spirits in those people. Um, but I think, you know, now that I think more about the sound, I think it also came from singing in a vocal jazz group. Like you mentioned Gold Company at Western Michigan. I had to, I sang like the top soprano part and a lot of the repertoire since we had 16 singers is like, you know, a huge range, um, you know, vocal range covered in the, each song, each arrangement. So I had to sing crazy high notes. And I think that's where like, I started doing that and realizing I could do that. And going for that like jazz choir soprano sound is definitely part of, you know, my solo singing sound too. So. Yeah, and that comes across in, in your music and, and from the title track, just the, the lines that you come up with and it just, they're beautiful. Like, <laughs> I replicate, but it, it, you and you wrote and, and arranged all of the all of the tracks on your album, isn't that right? Almost all of them. Yeah, there's two that are. Yeah, you're almost right. Yeah, there's two that are written by my bandmates. I, they're actually all my bandmates are great composers, but two of them I I asked to write songs for our band. So that was the one in Japanese called Voices Magic, written by Tomoko Amura, and then um, Happy to Stay is written by. Michael Sachs, who plays the bass clarinet and saxophone in the band. So, but everything else was mine. Yeah. How your group came together, because that takes a lot of effort and synergy, right? To find the right people that just mesh with you and can vibe off each other. Like, how did that come to be your group? Yeah, um, you're totally right. And for me, I think having the right people to play my music was integral to even, you know, feeling like I'm confident enough to move forward with my music and with gigs of my own and stuff. Um, so I met everyone, let's see, I met Tomiko, the violin player in Boston. We were in a folk band together, a world folk band called the Guy Mandelo Ensemble. And uh, we weren't playing any jazz, but you know, we were in this band for like, it was a cool gig and we just bonded over enjoying improvisation. So we'd been friends for years. And then um, the bass clarinet player, Michael Sachs, also went to NEC, New England Conservatory, where you mentioned they went to grad school. He was a friend. And then the rhythm section um, I met in New York on a session, actually. I had a, a good friend that was encouraging me to play my music with people because I kind of, I got to New York and I was a little intimidated, you know? And so he set up a session and was just like, at someone's place, you know, and just like, come over and bring your tunes and we'll just play through them. And the three people that ended up being on this session, which anyone, you know, that plays jazz in, in New York or anywhere else knows that like, you do a lot of different sessions and like, different combinations of people but it ended up being you know Matt Aronoff the bass player and Chris Siemba on piano and Jeremy Noller um did I say it back on drums yeah sorry if I said it backwards um 
Did I say, yeah, Matt Aronoff on bass. I forgot what I said. I feel like I'm announcing my band. Um, so I ended up being the three of them on the session, and I just loved the way they played my music. And I was like, whoa, this is it. Like, maybe I can play this music, and maybe I'm not a terrible composer. You know, it just totally shifted how I felt about it. And then maybe like a week or two later, a friend of mine booked me on a concert series. And so I asked them because I was like, oh, I just met them and they sound great. And then that was it. <laughs> it and then pretty much every gig has been the same people unless someone can't make it and I'll sub out, but I try to have the same people, which really helped the music um, grow and become what it did for the recording. So. Sounds like a right place, right time move. Right yeah, back. absolutely. Right. <laughs> yeah. Like feel lucky that's great so they were they a large inspiration as far as coming out with unraveled or did you have this was this long in the making your kind of your vision for this album um it yeah they were i mean they were the total inspiration i would say because when we started playing gigs uh this was probably back in 2013 maybe even a little before um i was of the mind that i just wasn't ready to put out an album um for many reasons, uh, but so then I I had finally taken some pressure off after like thinking previously like you have to make an album. When I met them, it was just like I'm just going to play music and play these gigs and not pressure myself to make an album. So it did take a while, but because it took because we waited so long, we played so many different shows. I really feel like I got the best of everything that we had worked on, and like there were certain songs that that I would change the arrangement like every time and like finally landed on a way to play it that was the best. And so Unraveled is totally a product of all that time that we spent playing, rehearsing together. And I'm so grateful to them. They're just amazing, so. And or did you, um, was it kind of a natural process? Like some, some of my material, I'm just thinking, you don't even have charts. It was like something that just was written in the moment. <laughs> do that or do you like write everything out? I did write everything out. Um, although I love that kind of, that way of doing things too and I actually want to push myself to do things that way a little more because I tend to be very like okay this is how it is but at the same time like leaving things really open so I write everything out but then come to a rehearsal and genuinely ask for input and we you know work out different things with tempos and grooves and you know someone would suggest adding something in and I would do it you know stuff like that so now I just want to transition and talk a little bit about your uncle that's all right who yeah. I um, very sorry to hear about your loss. Um, Thank you. Very, very hard. And because it was very recent, February, mm -hmm. right? Yep, six months. Yeah. Um, maybe we can just talk, you know, start by talking a little bit about your relationship with him and maybe how he influenced your music and what, you know, growing up alongside him was like. Sure. So my family would play his music around the house all the time. So I, I just grew up with this, you know, Pat Metheny group music, just it was, you know, the soundtrack of my life basically, um, and just always something that just felt part of me. I didn't see him a ton growing up because he was always on the road, though there was a stretch of time where he was living in Wisconsin and he would spend some holidays with us. And so I really, you know, I knew him as a kid, as my uncle, like enough that, you know, I was comfortable with him. And then when I went to college for, for jazz, it was funny because I was this whole time, you know, developing myself as a musician, but like, we didn't really have any contact, like, it, musically you know it's not we didn't talk about music but then when I went to college for jazz finally like one day I remember being in my dorm room he called me up to have a conversation and was like you know I was really surprised and it it turned out that he really wanted to be part of my life and you know help mentor me because he was like wow what you know I didn't realize you were going into jazz this is you know <laughs> kind of surprised that somebody was like continuing the family tradition or something and um so I guess yeah I guess I was 18 at that point and then we just kept up this ongoing conversation for many years. He loved to write, you know, really intricate long emails and every phone conversation would be like an hour to three hours, you know, and um, it would, it was uh, to the point where like we'd schedule our phone calls. So I would have the whole evening free so I could make sure I could talk to him. And um, he's just a um, total genius in every sense of the word musical. Yes. But also, and he's just like a, a lover of so many things like software design architecture and history and art and he just he loved to know everything about everything and then share all of his knowledge so I, I tried to soak up whatever I could 
And then at some point he, he started mentoring me in composition too, or he would, would like listen to some of his music and he'd tell me about why he wrote what he wrote and his like, he's just extremely intentional about everything that he did. And he, I remember him saying like, you know, I'll send you this big band arrangement that I wrote like 20 years ago. And he's like, you know, I remember every note because I meant it. <laughs> like he remembered every note he wrote as the big band arrangement. That's just like mind blowing to me. <laughs> so his brilliance was pretty, pretty crazy, but he's a very special and generous, lovely person. Very hard to lose him. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I I discovered him I think through one of his earlier albums and just I remember hearing likening him a little bit to the music of like George Winston in one aspect just because I think his music crosses so many genre barriers and just mm. hard to categorize his music right because it's very yeah. and deep and it's it's its own living breathing thing so mm -hmm. it can stand alone but also be so supportive like is the part of Pat Metheny group and then also the lovely video that you shared today um, on your Facebook oh, that yeah cool. yeah his song Sienna uh, he wrote that for um, one of his for like a Brazilian ex-girlfriend of his name Amelia and, uh, and then Pedro amazing singer that sang for Pat Metheny group um, Pedro Asnar wrote a Spanish lyric to it but I don't think he never they never recorded it um, with Pedro singing. So that live recording is really special. Yeah. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Such a gift to be able to write music with, with melodies like that. Just, I know. Just, it's almost like a stream of consciousness. Did he talk at all about his process, how he would um, write? Would it all just kind of come out <laughs> and he'd have to learn it? Or... Um, <laughs> that would be cool. Um, yeah. I mean, he, he would talk about the process, like kind of like a lot of people talk about like the inspiration part of it is only like 5% or 10%. And he really would say like, you know, I would get an idea or an inspiration and then I would do the hard work. And for him, it was sort of like two phases of, you know, finding, being creative, finding something. And then like, he really would say like, it's like being a scientist or like, you know, I just would take the idea and then <clears throat> mine the material. So like, you know, try to get everything he could out of a small melodic snippet, like turn it around in all the different ways that he could and see how it could be used as a melody, but maybe also as a bass line or as a counter line or as a solely section or as a basis for harmony. So he was very much about like taking bits of material and using them in many different ways. And um, he was always pushing me to like do that part of the hard work because of course, like many young musicians, I'm just like, have the inspiration and I get really frustrated and, you know, and give up or, you know, don't work hard enough on it. So he was always pushing me. He's like, it's not going to feel like the inspiration part feels. It's going to feel like you're doing hard work. It's going to be frustrating, but you need to treat it more like scientific and logic minded. Um, and I know that's, you know, everyone has their own ways of composing and different views on that and it'd be a little more unusual, but I love that concept and I've definitely internalized it. I wouldn't say, I mean, I definitely haven't mastered those ideas anywhere close to the way that he did, or maybe I don't even necessarily feel that's the way that I want to do things, but it is a huge part of like the way that I might approach composing sometimes. <laughs> I can almost hear his influence in a way, just with the way your, your lines are. I can hear like the, the analytical side of me kicking in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's there for sure. And, uh, did you ever get a chance to like work? I know back in 2009, um, I understand you you performed alongside him at a couple of music venues and yep. with Danny. Yeah, we did. Um, oh, you just not with Pat Metheny though. I don't know. Oh, okay, was, just, just that would be cool. No, it was uh, it was his group. We did um, the Zeltzman Marimba Festival in Appleton, Wisconsin, in 09, and we did the Gilmore Keyboard Festival in Kalamazoo, which you probably know about as a Michigander. Um, and he, he wrote some new music for it. And, uh, yeah, those were the only two times we got to play together because after that he basically retired from music, which I know is really interesting because most people don't ever, like most musicians say that they never stop playing or never retire. But for him, I feel like, you know, the performing side of everything was harder because he really just loved writing. You know, he was a composer at heart. He would always say that. Um, so I think after like this long, wonderful, successful career, he was like, you know what, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm just going <laughs> to enjoy my life in LA. So 
but I'm so glad I got to catch the tail end and, and sing with them because that was some of the most amazing experiences of my life for sure. I'd love to share them. Um, are, are they available on your website or on YouTube? I can post them on my page. The, the... Oh, the performances? Actually, no, they're not. They, oh. they were never released. Yeah, he was so, so particular about what of, of his was released. So, you know, if the sound quality wasn't perfect or, you know, for whatever reason. So they're not out there, but. <laughs> well, an air of mystery around it, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah keep it alive in other ways you know talking mm -hmm. about it or right sharing yeah. it or playing it do you, do you still have the music from it and are oh you yeah i do play it yeah yeah it's very special some of the hardest stuff i've ever sung too Ooh. i'll send you a link for i don't know if you've heard the song shireen you of his um yeah i'll send it to you that that'd be a cool one to post yeah. it's like this insane um like Brazilian style melody that he asked me to learn for the concert. And um, initially I told him like, that's not possible to sing. It's just not possible. <laughs> and then he was like, well, <laughs> let's see if you can do it. And so I, I did, but so that recording doesn't exist, but I'll send you that. That'd be a nice thing to post of him playing it. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> it is entertaining to watch from a little bit I've seen live. Um, yeah. You know you see someone so consumed and so loving what they're doing. And so in the moment, mm -hmm. you really yeah. know. It's pretty incredible. <laughs> so where, where are you now? So with COVID going on right now, you just had an album um, and touring is at a crash hall right now. What are you, what are the ways you're kind of keeping your fans engaged? I'm just curious. I'm asking everyone this because I don't have the answer. I'm just wondering. <laughs> no idea. Yeah. Um, I've been doing some online collaborations with people. Um, recently, I've been working with um, Yaron Gershovsky, who is the piano player and music director of the Manhattan Transfer. He's been writing some arrangements and, uh, you know, recording his part and then sending it to me and then I record my part. It started out as like two, just two songs where I sang, you know, the solo part. And then the second or the third thing we did was a four part vocal arrangement of this song called The Windmills of Your Mind. And now the next thing we're doing Oh, dude, that's that's a... album. Oh, really? Oh my gosh. <laughs> An arrangement of that for my, for my upcoming album. That's crazy. Well, I have that to hear crazy. it. Now. I just learned the song like was a month ago or something. Yeah. It's an amazing song. It is. It's very difficult. I, I underestimated it before I really got into it. Yeah. The grand yeah. is. <laughs> I know. I know. I'm like, where do you breathe? Right? <laughs> wow. Oh, I'll send that to you. It's, hey. a, it's a gorgeous arrangement. Sorry for the sirens. Um, I thought it was music for a split second. I oh, thought it no, it's sirens, <laughs> city life. Um, so yeah, and, and actually, I'm working on another recording with him, and this time it's going to be eight parts. So I'm gonna have my work cut out for me. <laughs> um, so that's been really fun collaborating with him, and um, I've done a couple other things, and I've also done like I think three streaming concerts of me well two of them are me playing piano and singing which has been really cool because i don't usually perform on piano but i love playing piano so oh, that's been cool i was gonna ask that's fantastic isn't it hard to do both i find it still very challenging to call yeah it's tough it's like i've been doing it my whole life so it feels natural in a way but i don't think anything i'm doing on the piano is very sophisticated so it like it, it works for me but it's not like i wouldn't call myself like a pianist you know right but, but this forced me to do that and i did a pre-recorded concert voice and piano that I'm very happy with. And then I also did a concert with my piano teacher that I mentioned, because I was in Wisconsin this summer. Um, we did a duo concert that was streamed and had like an out outdoor audience um, like two months ago now. Yeah, so that was fun. I think the streaming stuff is, is cool and it's a nice way to feel connected when you just wouldn't otherwise, so. Definitely, nice. definitely. There's uh, definitely been an increase in the Instagram life and then, you know, mm -hmm. trying to just be connected on there and definitely with the live streaming, but mm -hmm. it'll be interesting to see how things progress, you know, and how we ease back into live performances. You know? I know. I, I think there's something like kind of freeing about the live streaming thing because I feel like there's less pressure. Like normally I, I wouldn't want to live stream. I didn't, I don't think I ever live stream anything of mine and now I'm just so used to it and it feels like a really cool way to reach like my family and friends that don't live in New York and stuff. And so I, I kind of like it, yeah. continue it, you know. 
the connectivity part has been really easy. I wouldn't be able to connect with you or anyone like on Hannah's Corner if this didn't force me to kind of. <laughs> I know, it's cool. And it, it shows us like this was here all the time and we, you know, didn't think of it. So it's kind of, it's one of the nice things. <laughs> it's good to try to stay positive about that stuff. <laughs> But no, I'm just really excited for, for your, you know, career just because I love the music you write. I loved your last album. I'm already looking forward to the next and I am really excited for what's next for you. So. Thank you so much. So yeah. nice. And I'm really excited for your album too. I'm Thanks. For your, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, um, you know, I, I was going to come out the end of this year, but just with, with everything going on, I just decided to push it to mm -hmm. uh, February. So fingers crossed. That's probably good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It's going to be a crazy year end on a lot of levels, I have a feeling. So. Yep, I think so. It's smart. <laughs> well, thank you so much for, for joining us on Hannah's Corner. And thank you, Gerhardt and Jessica, for tuning in. And <laughs> for anyone else who's catching this, this later, I will be posting a couple more pieces of Aubrey's. So. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me, Hannah. So nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Have a fantastic yeah. evening. Thank you, you too. Bye-bye.